I'm Ed Nersessian, uh, director of the Helix Center. I want to welcome you all to these two days of roundtables uh, focusing around the ideas of Abby Warburg. Uh, I would like uh, to say primarily that I want to thank uh, all of you who are here. I realize it's an early morning time. We are usually not here at this hour and thank all the participants who've come from various places in the world to be part of this uh, meeting. Uh, from our side, I think Rob Penzer has done a tremendous amount of work to organize this, and I'd like to thank him. <laughs> and I would like also to thank Francois Cribiget, who is here from London and who is director of the Abbey Warburg Institute in London. The beautiful poster that you see out there and the brochure that you have here were all designed by him and sent to us from London. So I'd like to thank him. Uh, we are very honored today here to have the uh, Ambassador Francois Barra from Switzerland, and I'm going to ask him to say a couple of words. Dear Head, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to have uh, Switzerland associated to, uh, to your symposium. You may ask why, why Switzerland is associated. Well, you know the relationship between Warburg and, and Switzerland, Kreuzlingen, Binswanger, Clinic Bellevue. But a more important association is through the Agalma Foundation, which supports uh, this, uh, this symposium. The Agalma Foundation is based in Geneva and uh, is supported by another foundation called the Wilsdorf Foundation, which owns the Rolex watch company. So it's really rooted in Geneva and has an important, I would say, <laughs> an important support. Uh, the mission of the Agalma Foundation is to explore the relationship between uh, neuroscience, psychoanalysis, and art. And uh, the two persons in charge of the foundation are here today, uh, Pierre Magistretti and, uh, Francois, and Francois Ansermé. And the idea of this symposium if I understand well, is born or was born from a conversation between Professor Galese from Parma, Pierre and, and Francois in a, in a train between Geneva and Lausanne. So, <laughs> so uh, they were talking about uh, Warburg and about his concept of uh, science without name, which uh, basically uh, uh, tries to bring together various disciplines, anthropology, history of art, and biology. And um, the objective of the Agalma Foundation is also to build bridges between the sciences and, and art and uh, humanities. So um, they said, that's interesting. Warburg uh, as a resonance for us, means something for us, so let's try to do something. And then they spoke to Ed Narcissian, and today we are here. So that's the link to Switzerland. I wish you a very successful conference, and have a good day. Thank you. Introduction now. Actually, Ambassador Barras, you, you can see, you know, how professional our our, uh, our ambassadors because he told everything I asked to tell. <laughs> he, he really uh, made his homework and <laughs> and said everything I wanted to say about the Agalma Foundation. So thank you, uh, um, Francois. Thank you, Ambassador Barras. Anyway, as, as president of the Agalma Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to. Um, to welcome you all here. Uh, it's true that we, uh, we actually had the idea of this uh, symposium, uh, uh, Vittorio, Francois, and myself, one evening after, I should say, there was some facilitator 
uh, uh, facilitating substances like wine. We actually had quite some wine, and then suddenly we had this idea of organizing something uh, here. And <clears throat> more seriously, the, uh, again, as mentioned very clearly by Ambassador Barras, the uh, Agalma Foundation uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as its mission to try to bridge um, uh, uh, build, uh, build bridges between uh, neuroscience, psychoanalysis, culture, and society. And uh, in these days, I think, of uh, super specialization and where um, academic life uh, has uh, lost a little bit of its freedom, I think. I, I can say this after having been in academic life for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> it's really very refreshing and very important that there are uh, places like uh, the Agalma Foundation and I think the Helix Foundation where uh, uh, there is a freedom of thinking, a freedom of making connection, thinking outside the box and, and trying to, to move uh, uh, fields uh, forward, not necessarily uh, in a very disciplinary way. And, and this is really the, the goal of the foundation. Um, in terms of activities, the foundation organizes um, uh, <clears throat> discussions, I should say, um, between uh, a, a guest that Francois and I invite, uh, and then we uh, speak for about 45 minutes. I have to say we were very much uh, influenced by uh, what uh, Ed had launched many years ago with the uh, Philoctetes Foundation, uh, a very, again, very free discussion uh, on, on a, not necessarily even on a specific topic, topic but just uh, uh, in our case, what we, we, we try to do is what we say an experiment with someone outside neuroscience and psychoanalysis and see how he or she, particularly from the, in the case of the uh, art and culture, how we, we can you know, have some ideas emerge from this kind of strange mix between neuroscience, psychoanalysis, and, and, and someone from the cultural world. Uh, and these uh, discussions are filmed, again, very much inspired by what Ed has launched, and then they are on YouTube. So if you go on the uh, Agalma uh, uh, website, you can see we have now about, uh, I think, over 20 of such uh, in, in discussions, and you, know, you may find them interesting. Some of them are in English. I have to say most of them are in French. But uh, then other activities of the foundations are to organize, uh, occasionally, uh, small workshops like this one. We just had one. Uh, last week in Geneva uh, for the 100th anniversary of the death of uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, the linguistic uh, from Geneva. Uh, it turns out, uh, just uh, out of curiosity, you may be interested that a member of the, Agalma, of the board of the Agalma Foundation is uh, Christian de Saussure, a descendant of, uh, of <laughs> Ferdinand de Saussure. So that was even more uh, appropriate uh, for us uh, to discuss this. And we had, again, a bit, little bit in a smaller scale, but the same idea, neuroscientists, uh, uh, psychoanalysts, uh, linguists, uh, philosophers uh, was, I think, quite uh, productive. And we will have, actually, a small publication come out of this uh, workshop. And then we, um, we try to uh, sponsor certain uh, research efforts, which, uh, for those of you who have tried uh, to engage in uh, um, experimental approaches, uh, bringing together psychoanalysis and neuroscience, uh, it's, it's quite difficult if without a kind of denaturing both of them. So it's a really very difficult exercise, but we think it's a worthwhile exercise. And so we have some, um, some um, fellows who, who work on this topic. Actually, we have uh, with Christine Alberini, who is uh, quite unique because she's a prominent neuroscientist and also a psychoanalyst here at NYU. And uh, so we have a project with her, and we have a couple of other projects at the Federal Institute of Technology where, where I work. So this is to give you the, the context and, the, and the, the interest of the Agalma Foundation. And um, it looks like, I mean, looking at the program, and I would like to thank uh, um, Ed, of course, and all the people who uh, contributed uh, to organizing uh, and bringing together uh, the people. We have now uh, an experiment that will go on in the style we, we like at the Agalma Foundation and I think also at the Helix Foundation. So thank you very much, and I hope we have a very productive two days. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, I didn't say anything about Helix. I assume everybody knows about Helix, but if you don't, I'd be happy to talk to you after the meeting. Uh, 
Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce the uh, participants in this roundtable in the briefest way possible, and then we'll get going. Uh, I will start with Ludovica Lumer, who is sitting there. And uh, she is a philosopher and a neuro neurobiologist, and has worked with uh, Samir Zeki, who is uh, one of the founders, I guess, of the neuroesthetics movement in London. Next to her is uh, Vittorio Galese, who is professor of uh, physiology in the Department of Neuroscience of the University of Parma, and well known for his discovery of the mirror neurons. Sitting there is Anjan Chatterjee, who is a neurologist and member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania. And I believe he has a book coming out on neuroesthetics, or it's already here, I don't know, but it's certainly coming out this week. Uh, David Friedberg, who has participated in a number of our round tables in the past, is professor of art history at the University of Columbia and director of the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies in America. And uh, finally, Andrea Pinotti is, uh, teaches aesthetics at the University degli Studi di Milano and is director the dire director de program at the College International de Philosophie in Paris on the project Monument Nonument, correct? Okay, so we'll get going. To get this roundtable started, I asked uh, Vittorio to just say very, very brief words, a few words, to get us oriented on the subject, and then everybody else would jump in. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, particularly because uh, that dream uh, that was conceived in, uh, in Switzerland between Geneva and Lausanne uh, uh, is now real. I mean, we are here. Uh, we will spend two days discussing uh, uh, this amazing uh, figure of uh, uh, Abi Warburg, I think, um, uh, we begin to appreciate how innovative his approach was, perhaps particularly today, uh, when we are experiencing uh, um, a new way of, uh, um, a new form of dialogue between uh, disciplines that at first sight uh, may look uh, as remote as possible, like the study of the brain, the study of art, of culture. And Warburg uh, um, embodies, uh, I think, a, in a marvelous way, this uh, curiosity and this attempt to, to bridge uh, different fields of expertise, uh, particularly uh, because um, cognitive neuroscience uh, is very popular. Uh, every, every day we read uh, the, back, the big headlines in the newspaper. Oh, we discover what romantic love is all about. We discover a tiny little area where beauty sits uh, and the like. Uh, this, um, I would say, uh, uh, outrageously excessive form of reductionism needs to be tempered by an open dialogue with people uh, that, because of their background, uh, tend to look at the individual in, in a more holistic way. So we must bring back the brain to where it belongs, to the body in the first place. But this brain-body uh, complex, it makes sense to study it uh, to the extent that even if we move from uh, a, a methodological reductionist approach, so we are dealing with the nuts and bolts, so to speak, of what it means to be human, the ultimate goal must be to go back to the holistic view of human nature. And if we want to do that, we cannot leave out uh, from our investigation uh, artistic expression, creativity, 
and how this relates to something which is hidden uh, in our psychology. So I think that uh, psychoanalysis, neuroscience, uh, the humanities, broadly speaking, uh, now finally are in, um, in a position to, to collaborate to this very exciting uh, uh, enterprise of shedding light on who we are, uh, exploiting also uh, this new level of description that cognitive neuroscience. And I think uh, a prominent figure uh, to bless, so to speak, uh, uh, this enterprise, I couldn't imagine a better figure than Abibabu. So, um, as I was thinking about today's uh, meeting, I thought, I don't think of myself as a neuroesthetician. I think of myself as an art historian who makes use of tools that seem to me that will illuminate um, the objects of our studies. And uh, as many of you know, I have long insisted on the importance of opening one's mind to science and not getting too anxious about the alleged reductivism of science. But as I was thinking about today's symposium, I realized that probably once one was a child and suddenly one is old, and probably I may have been in this audience the first person to have gone to the Warburg Institute. Um, so I wondered whether I could just begin with a little background. Um, so I arrived in Oxford to do my graduate work in art history at the end of 1969, and Francis Haskell, who had just taken over from another great and extraordinary hermeneut and um, uh, art historian Edgar Wint, who was a Warburgian, of course, um, was a high British positivist, and he looked at me and he said, you can't study here, go to the Warburg Institute in London. So I went to the Warburg Institute, so that was at the end of 1969, and as I was reflecting on the direction of Warburgian studies and the ways in which uh, many of us here, including myself and Vittorio, have sort of seen the links between A.B. Warburg and neuroscience, I realized that it wasn't always so. Because when I got to the Warburg Institute, the emphasis was completely on both Michael Baxendall and Ernst Gombrich, yeah. were completely on the Nachleben der Antika. Gombrich had done his own stuff on perception, as we all know, in Art and Illusion, but the real Warburgian work at that time and throughout the 1970s and even into the 1980s was really about iconography and the Nachleben der Antika. So when I wrote The Power of Images, sort of thinking about the other as aspect of A.B. Warburg, which has now come to the fore, in other words, this kind of psychological roots of human responses to images, embodied above all in the whole notion of the pathos formula, the pathos formal. In other words, those aspects of art which move us because of the collocation of emotion and movement in the body and its effects on the bodies of others, of course tied up eventually with the work of the mirror neuron group in Parma. Um, this was really a, a very late comer on the Nachleben of Warburg himself in London. No one would have thought that the cognitive neuroscience offered any access to the works of A. B. Warburg, to the work of A.B. Warburg. So actually this is all a late development the whole, it was always there in Warburg, the notion of the emotional consequences of moving drapery and dancing bodies and so on. But nobody until fairly recently, I mean, we have lots of people here, Chris Wood has written eloquently about it, Chris Johnson also. Um, but for a long time, the original conception, the really original aspect of Warburg's con contribution was relegated to this um, more, uh, more positivist decoding of the great iconographies of the Renaissance. So now we have reclaimed what seems to be the most moving aspect, as it were, of A.B. Warburg, and it's finding its fruition in the kinds of work which we have seen done amongst the cognitive neurosciences with the development of the neuroscience of emotion, emotion movement and so on. So we can move ahead in this direction, but I just thought that that historical background would be useful. Adding perhaps uh, another issue to this question of the historical background, more generally as regards uh, German culture in, in the 19th century, 
um, Vittorio, you told about us about this um, figure, special figure of Barburg um, as a possible bridge between uh, uh, natural sciences and uh, um, humanities. Uh, we know that the German philosophical and the epistemological discourse was responsible for the division, the terminus technicus between uh, Geisteswissenschaften on one side and Naturwissenschaften on the other side. Uh, nevertheless, it was not uh, unfrequent that students uh, and scholars training in one field took courses in the other. Warburg himself uh, is, a, is a, an example, an emblematic example, because uh, he was trained as an art historian, but in the 90s he went to Berlin to attend courses in uh, medicine at the Faculty of Medicine. There he studied neurology, mm -hmm. and, and you find uh, in the fragments uh, on uh, the psychology of expression very interesting sketches and drawings uh, on the structure of the nerves, on the problem of the reflex, and, and uh, th there are drawings about the relationship between um, stimulus and response. And then he read uh, neurologists like uh, Ewald Hering and the very important uh, lecture in 1870 on memory as organized matter. And then uh, among his sources there was uh, Richard Zemon, a zoologist and neurologist as well, who gave him the terminus technicus mneme and gram. So uh, he was really uh, imbued with this uh, literature. And I think that just taking one of, of the most famous concepts in uh, Weyerbrock's discourse, uh, uh, sophrosyne, the ancient Greek word uh, uh, that it translates with beson and height. I, I, I'm not sure what an English uh, possible translation would be, uh, caution, prudence, uh, um, being wise, uh, not being impulsive. There you, you find this idea of distance as interval, pause as crucial. It was not only a, a question of symbolic distance. The one that he discusses, for example, in the serpent ritual lecture, that uh, modern technology destroys the distance uh, that magic and, and art uh, had instituted between man and, and world. He speaks all, also of distance in a neurological way meaning the distance between the stimulus, the response, and the uh, human being has the creature that can procrastinate, that can introduce mediation, uh, postponement, uh, a creature that is not obliged to immediately respond to the stimulus, but that can respond, uh, and Zemon was very important to him in this context, uh, in a procrastinated way, in a delayed way. Image plays in this frame, I think, uh, uh, a very fundamental role uh, because image has uh, a biological meaning in this, uh, biological utility in helping men in negotiating between uh, stimulus and response postponing the response, even for centuries, even for, for uh, thousands of years. And so this idea of Trishan uh, Raum, Denk Raum, the, the space in between, the space for thought, the space for memory, Andacht Raum, all terms that Warburg evokes as a constellation around the Sofrosyne term, I think they can also be usefully investigated from a neurological perspective, rooted in those young years of his studies in Berlin. I wonder if I could uh, pose a question that, as I've been listening to this, that I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around, um, which is on the one hand, uh, 
there are cultural theories, and of which I uh, am relatively ignorant of. And on the other hand, there is psychoanalysis, um, of which I am relatively ignorant. And ensconced in between. Ignorant together is bad. <laughs> is that like a double negative? <laughs> um, and then there's neuroscience, of which I have some knowledge, and, and in part, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the relationships of these things are. And on the one hand, you can think of cultural theories as something that is an emergent property of a whole lot of things, but can't be reduced to what one individual person or what in, one individual brain is doing. And at the other end, at least my medical school um, knowledge of psychoanalysis is a deep dive into the individual at the level of the content of what they're talking about, what they're thinking about, what they're dreaming about, what they associate, so on and so forth. But neuroscience in some ways seems to be somewhere in between, at least the way it's typically practiced, which is on the one hand, our methods are driven to try to generalize. It's the inherent nature of much of empirical research is you want to get generalizable principles, but not typically so generalizable that they are applicable to cultural theories. And the very inherent nature of generalizing is that we typically tend to be less interested in the individual, right? The individual becomes one exemplar of a general principle that we're trying to derive, right? And psych so psychoanalysis, on the one hand, seems to be, seems to drill down at the individual and the content of the experience of the individual that we typically try to do away with in, in most neuroscience studies. Uh, and, but our generalization doesn't generalize to the point of having, at least in a transparent way, uh, making contact with, with cultural notions. And, and I'm just curious what people think about is this, are these tensions that are inherent in the disciplines or are these just historical tensions that have to be traversed and, and settings like this might help in that regard? And it's my turn to answer. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a small issue. <laughs> Actually, one of the things that was fascinating me more, the most, about Warburg is that he's uh, expressing, I'm not sure for the first time in the history of thought, because we can always go back to the Greeks for almost everything, but exactly the tension between uh, subjective and objective individuality and uh, socially. And I think, I don't know, it's one, it's one of the most <coughs> striking things that make uh, us what we are, this uh, tension of being a self, but uh, this self is uh, developed and, and we reach our concept of being uh, who we are in the interaction with the other. So this tension is exactly what makes us what we are. <coughs> but. Uh, I think at the beginning of the century, at the end of the 1800, beginning of 1900, there was this crack somehow that uh, opened a discussion that uh, we, are we are still trying to, to solve today, even with the songs of yesterday of <laughs> Joseph Ledoux, <laughs> this uh, mind-body, matter over mind, and mind over matter, and this crack open up a, a, a sort of volcano from which came out uh, the destroying of all our stability and certainty about our conscious life, about space and time, about the possibility of measurements. So, and everything came out uh, at the same time. And even Warburg was there at the same time and was striking. Uh, you know, with the notion of magical and, uh, and real. And art, science, religion, 
because we don't talk about it, but it's still there. It's a big, it's a big part of our life anyway. Uh, we are there to try to find a solution about this gap, to, to, to give some, some anchor to which hold on, because otherwise we would collapse into this crack. And opening this, this volcano of things, we had to find sort of solution. We had to find our way through you know, to, to build a bridge. And, and I think Varbor was amazing in trying to do that. Probably was not absolutely, probably. I'm not an expert on, I read quite a lot about what he wrote, but I'm not an expert on him. But, uh, but he was, he was one of the first to try, maybe unconsciously, to find a bridge to overlap this gap. And this was, uh, you know, most of our life is uh, an individual experience. Now, we live with deep-seated in culture, and culture is a big part of what we are, but we live in, in, in our individual life and experiences. And so he describes uh, the experiences, for example, in front of a work on art, of art uh, as uh, the most private thing, is empathic, is there, is talking to you, and you have to give life to the image you have in front. But then you have to insert in, in the history, in the culture. There is no, no history of culture without the history of an idea. So to make sense of this individual experience, you have to insert it in the development of, uh, of something broader, which is more or less the, the history of, of, we cannot even say the Western thought because it was linked to everything and everywhere. It destroyed completely space and time. The, this, the symbol could travel and live uh, without barriers in every time and every space. And this tension between the private experience of something and the objective is exactly what art is about and what uh, art came about uh, when, uh, you know, when there was this huge break uh, in the postmodernism. Uh, you know, art became, became an idea more than an image. Duchamp was uh, the master of that. You know, it was putting us in front of uh, your urinal, saying, now you have to perceive it as a piece of art. And until you don't perceive it as a piece of art, this is not going to be art. So you have to make this become something which can travel in history. So I don't know, it's, it's funny what you said, because it's something that, that I'm struggling with, uh, trying to, to make sense of it, of, of this tension between the aesthetic private experience and the history. I think uh, Anian uh, raised a very important point about uh, uh, the relevance and the specific status of uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience when addressing uh, uh, these specific topics that traditionally, as uh, Andrea was reminding us of, uh, belong to these uh, separate domains, Naturwissenschaften and uh, Geisteswissenschaften. I think it's time to seriously question this uh, distinction and division. However, uh, we should also uh, bear in mind that when we speak of cognitive neuroscience, we basically describe a methodological approach. So we all recognize ourselves as cognitive neuroscientists to the extent that we all have a daily practice with these uh, very expensive toys uh, we call fMRI, high-density EEG, uh, PET, and the like. But you can use, employ these toys to um, ask completely different kind of questions. And uh, it's true that uh, to lay uh, the grounding, the, the, the foundational basis of uh, an approach to human nature based on this specific methodological approach, it is unavoidable to start uh, with um, an approach that, so to speak, uh, uh, privilege uh, generalizing uh, uh, results, where we take the average uh, undergraduate, uh, most of the time white, 
uh, first world uh, college student to be uh, a sort of uh, um, uh, typical exemplar of, of the human species, <laughs> so to speak. And I, I mean, I don't need to uh, point out that uh, this is a very uh, uh, not only reductive, but uh, heavily uh, biased view of human nature. Uh, indeed, in the field of the study of emotions, people, there is a growing number of people, also of colleagues, that uh, begin to question the supposed universality of some of the, the findings upon which uh, the uh, empirical study of emotion was based uh, uh, starting from the second half uh, of last century. And interestingly, more and more of our colleagues are exactly thinking about how to study these uh, um, distinctive aspect of human nature, which is the individual quality of uh, uh, being a human being. And um, it is remarkable that as soon as you uh, decide uh, to leave behind uh, this approach uh, uh, to the supposed generality of the finding uh, uh, you're up to, uh, trying to dig more about uh, uh, the distinctive relationship between how your brain works and what your personal life history was, your attachment style, uh, the early experiences uh, uh, you, you had uh, uh, with your parents, with, with, uh, with other individuals, all of a sudden you realize that you spot incredible differences. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, a study where uh, people were uh, required to watch videos portraying the facial expression of their partner in pain. And it turns out that according to your personality profile, uh, different brain networks activate in spite of the exactly the same cognitive response. Uh, when you are uh, asked to evaluate the uh, unpleasantness and the uh, intensity of the pain that supposedly your partner is uh, feeling uh, by merely watching to this video showing the, the facial expression of your partner, this cognitive evaluation is the same in all participants. However, when you uh, look at which part of their brain is active, uh, you, you discover that people with a different affective style activate uh, the, the standard called the circuit for uh, the empathy for pain, the anterior part of the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, while other individuals uh, uh, don't. They uh, tend to activate more the visual part of the brain, the mesial aspect of the, of the brain, part of the what we call uh, the default mode network, uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So they most likely experience that particular image of their partner in pain in a completely different way, which can be partly also identified uh, 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 with our peculiar uh, methodological reductionist uh, approach. So I think there's a lot uh, to do, and this is why I think this time is really exciting. Uh, for all of us, because uh, now that we learn how to use this machine, we are perfectly familiar with the uh, instruction manual, so to speak. We know what to expect uh, from a technical point of view. We know the limitation of the technique. But at the same time, we should perhaps think a lot more. And um, someone said a long time ago that uh, science doesn't think. Uh, I think it's a, a way uh, a too extreme view, uh, but when reading some neuroscientific <laughs> papers, sometimes I think uh, Heidegger was right. So there's a lot of room uh, to improve uh, the heuristic value of this particular approach that I repeat offers you a further perspective on human nature, which will never be able to uh, give the final answer to the question uh, that uh, keep us uh, busy all the time, who we are. Uh, but I think it, it can uh, 
bring in uh, new data, uh, new perspective that if, um, interestingly, uh, discussed with the contribution of scholars from other disciplines can, can lead us to very interesting uh, results, I think. So I'm rather optimistic. You want to say something? Yeah. Um, so I'll wait. So um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, although Victoria and I have known each other for a long time, work together, I notice a slight backsliding here. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure that he's making uh, slightly unnecessary concessions. But never mind. I think no. the point is that, and I'll explain in a moment. I think uh, Anyan's question is a really important one. It's one which the people in the humanities, who, whom I work with mostly, ask all the time. I mean, the question is, how can the generalizing aspects of science be reconciled with the status of the individual, the effects of cultures and contexts? So, you know, whenever I hear this question, I always inclined to say, it's not a view which is well received, but I'm inclined to say, what's so difficult to understand about the situation? I'll tell you why I think this. Um, what I think has happened now, as the uh, sciences have come closer to the humanities, it's offered us, with, offered us an extraordinary opportunity, and that is, the best neuroscientists we just heard are attentive to context. There's no question about that. But how do we arrive at the understanding of the individual with all this generalization around us. And this is what I'm trying to, what I try to say is not so difficult to understand. In order to grasp the effects of individual contexts of past histories, both personal and historical, we still need to know what happens in the brain of all individuals, possibly even primates. But neuroscience also gives us the tools. This has been the great privilege for me. It also gives the one the tools to see and to understand better what happens when the human brain is modulated by the effects of individual cognitive experiences, individual inputs, individual circumstances. There is no, in my view, no distinction really between the task of the neuroscientists in establishing basic structures in the brain and figuring out how individuality is constituted on the basis of those. You know, we all have an amygdala. If the amygdala is lesion, you just walk straight into the traffic across the way. Amygdala is activated when you have a fear response. Now, obviously, some of us know snakes better than others. Um, you know, herpetologists are probably li less likely to be afraid of seeing a cobra, or at least seeing a, I, when I see a snake, I jump away. I don't make any distinctions, any taxonomic distinctions between those that are poisonous and those. But when you see, as Joe Ledoux has shown, you know, when you see something that moves a bit like a snake, everyone is going to have a startled reaction. And thereupon, uh, succeed. I mean, you know, the great beauty of the neuroscience is now it also gives us a sense of temporal operations and temporal distinctions within the brain. So I think the prospect here for understanding the individual is not curiously diminished by the kinds of techniques which we have available, but in fact enhanced. And that's why the backsliding, I just want to briefly, I don't think you need backslide away. So we need slide no, away I, too far I'm from, from basic emotions and so on be, and so forth. To be more so, outspoken, I'm really annoyed uh, <laughs> keeping reading articles where uh, the, it seems that people are even unaware uh, of uh, uh, the absurdity of translating uh, the personal level description uh, yeah. at the level of uh, typically amenable to, to our approach. So I'm, um, I'm not uh, uh, reducing the impact of neuroscience, actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a neuroscientist, that's oh, my job. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an art historian. I'm happy to spend time with, with, uh, with people like you, uh, but uh, my, <laughs> my approach is completely different. What I'm, uh, I, I meant to say is that there is not enough uh, uh, people are not enough aware uh, that um, our um, approach could be a lot more fruitful if we would abandon this kind of neurohubris, 
leading yeah. us to establish a one-to-one -one map between the words we employ to describe our inner life, uh, our emotion, our experiences, and brain networks. Because such a one-to-one -one map between words and neurons probably doesn't exist. Yeah. So the, the methodological reductionism that became available uh, 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 by the possibility of investigating uh, human nature with the tools of uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, uh, is uh, an invaluable tool enabling us to deconstruct such words yeah. and, for example, showing that uh, uh, many people got it right uh, when they were saying that uh, vision, uh, in a way, uh, um, is a sort of haptic experience. Uh, I'm thinking about Merleau-Ponty, for example. Now, with our expensive toys, uh, we can show that Merleau-Ponty was right. Because, indeed, all of our perception, in a way, is synesthetic. Uh, so it is really becoming hard to find uh, uh, parts of the brain that are unimodal. Even primary sensory areas, it has been shown, the visual cortex can be driven by auditory stimuli. Uh, primary auditory cortex activity can be modulated by visual stimuli. We were the first to show that uh, uh, your somatosensory cortex is activated visually when you see uh, the tactile experience uh, on someone else's body and the like. Uh, so it is really... Uh, our, um, our, the heuristic value of this approach is greatly amplified is if before addressing this empirical question you have a broader picture of the cultural context and you discover that many people were smarter than you are and uh, gave serious thought to this issue and came up with very interesting solutions. So I'm not denying the heuristic value of cognitive neuroscience, actually the opposite. What I, I, I would like to see it uh, employed uh, in, in, in a better way than it still is by many of our colleagues. That, that, that's my point. Let me make a few comments from the psychoanalytic end of things. Uh, I was very struck about, uh, with what you said about Warburg's interest in the neuron and the uh, transmission of the impulse because that's what Freud was interested in also. And uh, when he uh, worked on the project for a scientific psychology, that's essentially what he was doing. And what he was trying to do was take his observations, which came primarily from observing patients who at the time were diagnosed as hysterics and had all sorts of crazy symptoms, and try to see how he could explain those symptoms by understanding the function and the energies that moved within neurons via the axons and so on. And he also talked about, therefore, the blocking of the impulse, which is eventually what led to the theory of repression, which then became the central theory in psychoanalysis, because repression is what then defined and led to the notion of a dynamic unconscious which is, uh, as Freud himself distinguished it from other unconscious, the dynamic unconscious is what then influenced you in life by uh, running your <coughs> life a certain way as opposed to the other way. He also, of course, did do a lot of generalizing, and he at times uh, generalized too much. Uh, and uh, part of those uh, generalizations were the uh, and I should also just say, I think because it's not often recognized, that three or four of Freud's major works took, uh, occurred within a period of two and a half to three years. Uh, neuropsychology of defense, studies in hysteria, interpretation of dreams, and the project. Now, he was using some cocaine at the time, but it's a tremendous amount of work that came out from uh, the, the one brain. Uh, but one of the things he did, and because of the time 
you know, he was working on this and things were not as complex and complexity wasn't recognized the way it is today, is that he did create some simplifying formula so that you had psychosexual phases of development, you had things like Oedipal complex, which then served to generalize. So people had castration anxieties, people, so it wasn't just on the individual level, but was generalized and then applied to <coughs> larger issues. Uh, psychoanalysis, I think, has increasingly, uh, without saying so, moved away from that, and it has become a lot more about uh, the careful, uh, long-term, intense investigation of how one person's brain, mind, work. And in every possible detail that can be made available by the patient in the uh, mental frame of investigating himself or herself uh, on the couch four or five times a week. And that does give us significant amount of information. And what it does give us also is what you were saying is that everybody smiles, everybody dances, everybody says they love, but it's tremendously different. Uh, and that investigation, I think, is uh, very important. When neuroscience became so popular, I mean, there wasn't even neuroscience when I was in medical school. We talked about neurophysiology, neurochemistry, ne neuroscience. But neuroscience suddenly took off. There was also an over excitement from the psychoanalytic end. And similar things that are being done in neuroscience, putting somebody in an fMRI and saying, there is, there is the point of love, happened in psychoanalysis by saying, oh, well, this behavior is because of this part of the brain. It's inevitable, those kinds of things. But uh, I had a very interesting experience yesterday. I was honored by uh, Christina to be invited to her lab. And I went to her lab, and one of the graduate students presented uh, his research. To my mind, I'm not a scientist. It was very carefully done and well uh, presented about uh, an idea which he thought also confirmed Freud's idea, namely what we take for granted, that is childhood experiences influence you later in life. But he did that with rats and showed how uh, the effect of an electric shock and then showed it at what periods it becomes, uh, if you will, a memory that has an impact on future behavior and at which point it doesn't. But what then I, I was thinking about this and looking from the point of view of a psychoanalyst, I was asking myself when a baby has experiences, he doesn't or she doesn't just have one thing happen, like an electric shock, but has a number of things. And that these things interact. So the electric shock in the baby, hypothetical electric shock, may have an influence on the way he's going to uh, feel about the milk, and the way he's going to feel about the milk is going to influence something else. So that very early on, and the, 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 the graduate student showed this beautiful slide of uh, synaptic and neuronal development between the ages of six months, two years, and four years. And it's incredible, the change. It's like you have a handful of neurons and synapses, and then you have like a jungle. And so in this process, a lot of things are happening, but they are all interacting with each other. And so I think this is where uh, the fields can come together, because you can, have, you can just do that study, or you can begin to think of it in a different context, in a larger way, and see and begin to study how those experiences affect each other and what the consequence of it is, which may then have a connection to how, and this is the subject of this roundtable, you do or do not react or appreciate art. And so since you wrote a paper on this just recently, maybe you should say a few words about. Yeah, we, we, um, we decided to start uh, investigating uh, 
aesthetic experience, not just dealing with the notion that are so heavily culturally determined, like uh, the sense of beauty, for example, but we, we were interested uh, in um, investigating to which extent when you behold uh, uh, some artwork, particularly we decided with David uh, to start from the most difficult part of, uh, of this enterprise, namely to see what, what's going on in the brain-body system of a beholder when there's no body to resonate along with. So we decided to start not with the figurative art, but with the uh, modern abstract art. And the first uh, experiment was done on uh, Lucio Fontana's cuts. And uh, the second one that just came out uh, on the brush strokes of Franz Klein. And uh, although we employed two different approaches, we, we, we employed high density EEG. And in the first study, we just were happy to measure the level of desynchronization of the motor system of the beholder. So they are watching a static image, a cut by Lucio Fontana and a controlled stimulus where the cut is substituted by uh, a black line with the same length and width of the cut. But what is missing is the dynamic aspect of the static image, uh, namely the shade uh, produced by the cut in, in the depth of the canvas. And we never mentioned the word art, beauty, aesthetic experience. We only said to our volunteers, you're going to see images on the computer screen. Please uh, watch them carefully and try not to move as much as you can. Because mm -hmm. even uh, blinking uh, uh, can introduce artifacts when you record brain activity with this net on the head. And the results. Uh, were quite interesting and were fully compatible with the hypothesis David and I put forward in 2007, namely that uh, when you see uh, an object, a visual object, which is the consequence of uh, uh, someone's hand gesture, the brain of the beholder, so to speak, produces an embodied simulation of that gesture. And what you see is the reenactment uh, uh, of that gesture, which is purely uh, uh, simulated, because we recorded also the muscle activity of beholders, and their muscles were completely silent, but a part of their motor system was, uh, so to speak, reenacting the gesture of uh, performed by Lucio Fontana. And of course, we, we decided to employ uh, uh, Lucio Fontana's artworks, probably a cut. Uh, done by, by myself or by uh, Alessandro Umiltà, the main author of this paper, uh, would have worked the same. Although I was talking with uh, the curator of the Contemporary Art Museum in uh, uh, Prato, uh, the Pecci Museum, and he was telling me, you can cut a canvas a thousand times, but you will never <laughs> accomplish the end result uh, uh, Lucio Fontana uh, uh, <laughs> takes, <laughs> and uh, probably he's right, but uh, uh, nevertheless. And the second you study was on the brush job. strokes <laughs> of Franz Klein. Here uh, we had a more sophisticated approach uh, that enabled us also to locate uh, the sources of the, of the signal in the brain. And so we, we found three components. So our analysis became a little more sophisticated. And you, David, would be happy to hear this because uh, uh, you left behind uh, uh, the Einfühlung part of, of aesthetic experience. You want to know uh, more about the relationship between the brain and the evaluative aspect of aesthetic judgment. So basically, we found three networks. A sensory motor network, which most likely responsible of the enactment of uh, 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 the gesture employed by the artist, so dynamic, so charged with emotion. Then we found uh, activation in the orbitofrontal cortex, which probably I am uh, very cautious to establish this relationship, uh, because otherwise I would be uh, guilty of the same <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oversimplified vision of the brain I was blaming before. But nevertheless, there is some evidence that links the activation of this uh, ventral part of the frontal cortex with uh, uh, rewards, uh, 
so probably has to do with uh, the uh, joy or the uh, uh, positive feeling uh, induced by the aesthetic experience. And then we had the third cluster of activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which most likely uh, uh, has something to do with a more detached uh, and uh, evaluative uh, uh, observation um, of the artwork. Then we recently also uh, investigated uh, this relationship between the gesture employed to produce uh, a, a static graphic sign and what's going on in the motor system of the beholder. Uh, this time we em employed uh, uh, handwritten Roman alphabet letters, Chinese ideograms, and scribbles. All three kind of stimuli uh, activate the motor system of the, of the beholder, but they do it with a different intensity and with a different uh, uh, temporal uh, dynamic. It is as if, uh, and I'm very cautious, this is an hypothesis that has to be verified, it looks as if the motor system of the beholder were unconsciously capable of distinguish symbolic graphic sign, which lead to a stronger resonance from the scribbles, which have no symbolic value. Which brings in a further question. Uh, is there any biomechanic primitive shared by all forms of symbolic written language? This is an open question, no one uh, so far addressed empirically, but these preliminary results seem to <laughs> raise this as a, as a uh, possibility uh, uh, that can be empirically investigated. So, so far we, we focused on this relationship, the immediate relationship between something which is static but at the same time uh, is very intensively dynamic and we believe that we discover one component that gives this dynamicity to something uh, which is uh, a study. There is a wonderful de Koenig uh, at the MoMA, the blue one. I don't remember the, mm. the title of the painting. And every time I, I see it, uh, um, I, I stand in front of it, I, I feel moved, not only metaphorically, but physically. And I think uh, we, we can describe this component of the aesthetic experience. We can explain uh, why we are so moved that something that is still but uh, induces a lot of, of movement. Um, and this but is a possible you, way to Vittorio, go. you said that you didn't mention the word art aesthetic to the students or yeah. whoever, the, the when usual we white student the brain that activity. was inside yeah. the, so, and were they aware that these were works of art? Well, indeed, at the end of, of the experiment, were... we asked them a lot of questions. As you can imagine, we asked them um, to rate the quantity of uh, uh, dynamicity, of movement they could mm -hmm. spot in the static images. We asked them if they saw them before. We asked them if they considered uh, either the original artworks or the control stimuli as artwork. And one of the most interesting results of this study is that the same effect could be detected in all participants, no matter how acquainted they were. And so why do you images. speak about aesthetic experience? So how can you speak about aesthetic experience if they are not aware that is something link. I mean, how do you define aesthetics? Well, because for them is something. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I don't ask him. I have a similar and related I question. Have a question. In other words, when you go, <laughs> when you go in front of the de Kooning, yes, uh, you say that I feel moved. Yes. So you have, you are aware of something happening. In these uh, experiments you did, were the activations similar whether the person said at the end they were moved they mm. were or not there is all all people rated as more moving the original artworks than the control stimuli irrespectively from their knowledge 
those images to belong to art or not. So there is a, a, a tight relationship between the dynamicity of the image uh, recognized by the beholder and the degree of activation of their motor system. Then coming back to uh, your question, of course there's nothing intrinsically aesthetic in a sense in this experiment, although the easiest way to answer your question would be to uh, go back to the etymology of the word, the uh, eistasis, okay? So to, to put it shortly, but I'm happy to leave it to, to David. Uh, we never claim that aesthetic experience is the activation of the motor system oh, of sorry. mirroring mechanism, period. What we said that m our point is that aesthetic experience is a multi-layered uh, enterprise and one key dimension of aesthetic experience uh, uh, beside the socio-cultural uh, context in which it occurs, the framing effect, uh, blah, blah, blah. One key ingredient is this embodied ingredient. And this embodied ingredient uh, is uh, present uh, in our relationship with all kinds of images, not necessarily uh, uh, because of their artistic status, which, by the way, is historically determined. Uh, I was reading a, a paper in the New York Times about a recent uh, research showing that reading uh, uh, novels uh, leads you to a more empathic. And they were making a distinction between uh, highbrow literature and, I don't know what they employed, Fifty Shades of Grey, this kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, we call it, uh, uh, one, one of them must have been more yeah. realizing. Mm. So, and, and a journalist was asking me, well, what do you make of this distinction? And I said, well, uh, one should be very careful because Honoré de Balzac, who is now revered as a classic, was publishing uh, some of his uh, Comédie Humaine uh, 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 in newspapers. Um, so, all of these notions, judgments, evaluation, are very much historically determined. Even the very same notion of uh, Beaux-Arts is historically determined. Uh, that's why the tension between the objective way of looking at it and the subjective is something which you cannot get rid. I mean, you, when you talk about art, you cannot avoid feeling this, uh, this tension between uh, so anyway, art art is made by, by the evolution of culture. Art is, uh, art is, is not only a subjective thing. If you, if, you, if you are subjectively in front of something and you do not recognize it as art, probably it's not art. I mean, it has to make sense. Yeah, but what we now call art, for example, think about people uh, 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 um, uh, putting their hands uh, in... Uh, 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 covered with pigments on, on, on mm -hmm. caves. Uh, we call that art. Now, for them, probably had a completely different meaning. It was religion. It was uh, uh, the possibility to get into a different dimension. Uh, nobody really knows uh, uh, what was the meaning of this practice. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, even if you uh, bracket uh, this socio-cultural historical aspect that changed a long time, uh, there is something, I think, intimately related to our own human nature, which is a, a, a notion that for many decades uh, was considered politically incorrect. Okay, the human being is a construction, like, like Foucault put it, but this construction is made of bricks that are always the same, that's the point. And cognitive neuroscience can reveal the nature of those problems. Andrea has been waiting Thanks. to. Yes, I think that uh, a word uh, evoked by, by Ed uh, uh, should be introduced in this constellation that is inhibition. I think that uh, also David is working on, on, on this notion. Because when Vittorio says that uh, our response to images is a sort of motion and emotion response. So there is this idea of a, a motor reaction. The question is, uh, in the aesthetic attitude, uh, where uh, is the threshold between 
emotion that remains at a possible virtual or quasi-virtual response, reenactment, virtual embodied simulation. And when, for example, uh, in front of some images, very often uh, religious images, we have uh, we are elicited to a real response in vandalism, for example, or, or in iconoclasm. David here is a specialist of these reactions. There you have violent responses, and there the motor system uh, responds to images uh, in a very effective way, uh, somehow um, opposing the idea that the image, uh, as I evoked uh, in my first uh, intervention, is a mediation between the stimulus and the response. There, in vandalism, in iconoclasm, image seems rather to be a sort of a, a bomb uh, eliciting a very violent reaction. I think that this is important also because um, I have started a work um, uh, research uh, comparing some images uh, in which uh, Warburg was very interested in uh, images that represent inhibition. Um, Rembrandt, an etching showing Medea at uh, the wedding of uh, Jason and Creusa, and she is deciding to kill her kids, but she has not already killed them. She's there in the shadow thinking uh, of the strategy, of the decision, but she hasn't taken the decision definitely yet. Or again, Rembrandt, the Claudius Civilis, uh, uh, a painting uh, Barbu was very fond of. He had an, a, a copy made for the Institute and the copy is still hanging there today. Claudius Civilis is there with the Batavians gathered around uh, the sacred uh, table. They are deciding to uh, go against the Romans, the, the invaders, but they haven't decided it yet. So what they will do? Freud, Moses. In that essay, Freud collects uh, uh, opinions from the Kunstwissenschaft, from Burkert from Wölflin, and they all stress the fact that Moses is, in the, is uh, um, uh, represented by Michelangelo in the very moment preceding the action. Freud describes, and of course he is very interested in, in, in the foot and the position of the angle of the foot of the, of the statue. And we know that Warburg was obsessed with feet, uh, the nymphas' feet. Uh, and if you compare the yeah, Gradiva yeah. foot, you find that this Gradiva foot uh, is very similar to the Moses one, almost uh, erect uh, in uh, 90 degrees. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, uh, Lessing's Laucon. This is the pregnant moment before the decision. And this elicits, I think, uh, a very interesting kind of empathy in the beholder that I would call uh, diegetic or narrative empathy because your imagination starts working there and you start asking yourself, what is he going to do? Is he going to, to, to slash uh, his brother and all, all the rave party around the golden calf or <laughs> deciding something else? We know the story of course, from the, from the holy text. But we can also imagine possible different options. And this is a, a saturation of narrative into a single image. It, it is an image of inhibition. It is an image of uh, self-control. Uh, it is an image uh, of sophrosyne again, of besonnenite, of caution, of pre-decision, which is, I think, could be quite interesting to, to investigate, even uh, in the perspective of visu visual and motor systems. Yeah, you want to yeah uh, I, I'm hesitant to talk because it's not in direct response to what you said, but I do want to pick up some of the themes that have come up. Uh, one, this idea, as you said, very early influences. Well, the influences actually go quite early um, there's evidence, for example, that what a mother 
ingests in the third trimester has an influence on the taste that the child will later have, right? And taste is a, it's an evaluative judgment, it's a preference. Um, so these influences go, go very, very early, even before, uh, even before uh, people are born. Um, the, the question of this relationship between the individual experience and what can be generalized, or how do we deal with that, uh, there have been two strategies uh, in, in cognitive neuroscience, uh, and one, I think, in part you alluded to, which was Freud's roots, which came out of Charcot's clinic, uh, and that there is a long history uh, of careful observations of individual patients and trying to make inferences of how systems work on the basis of the systematic way in which brain damage produces consequences. And I would take one minor exception to what Vittorio said, which is I do not think cognitive neuroscience is a method. Uh, I think imaging has largely overwhelmed the public imagination of cognitive neuroscience, but it, it is fundamentally asking questions about what the brain basis for behavior is. And this goes back to the same intellectual climate that Freud was working on, that, uh, that Warburg stepped into. Uh, you can take it back to, to Broca, Wernicke, Lichtheim, Lissauer, Liebmann. Uh, these are the people that set, up, set out the agenda and the framework that we're still dealing with. Uh, and so, um, Part of what got me interested in neuroaesthetics was from the observation that when patients have brain damage, um, some patients that are artists, that they continue to produce art, and their art is actually, this is the exception, not the rule, but their art is actually better, or received as better than it, what it was before. This is the only major cognitive system where that observation has been made. Right? There are sensory phenomena in which uh, uh, that observation has been made, but if you talk about language, if you talk about any complex phenomenon, um, this kind of paradoxical facilitation in the setting of brain damage is something that has only really been reported in art, and that's telling us something important. It's telling us something important about the, the biologic uh, infrastructure uh, that is a, that in the context of producing art is sufficiently flexible. And one thing that these sort of detailed examinations of single cases, I think, can really be illuminating in a way that you, as you were suggesting that Freud did, you take individual patients and then you try to generalize uh, from that. In a way, the analysis can only be done on individuals because as soon as you take a group, you're washing away what is most interesting about that behavior. The second strategy that I think Vittoria alluded to, which is that in cognitive neuroscience, there has been an interest in, in individual differences. And I'll give you an example of an uh, art study we did, uh, which has been presented in abstract form but not written up, which is there's a, there's a fundamental question of if you say, um, do you like a Rothko painting or do you like Hopper, that there is nothing inherently correct about which answer you give. Right? This is an individual difference thing. Some people like abstract art, some people like representational art, some people like historic art, some people like contemporary art, so on and so forth. So when you're dealing with that kind of massive variability, how do you approach this as a scientist? And what we did was, and this was with a group of uh, schizophrenics and uh, people with schizophrenia as well as people uh, you know, with the normal controls, uh, and basically did the kind of experiment where people are shown pairs of paintings and they say, which is better? Which do you like more, right? And you go through a whole series of these. And we also had uh, these, rather than evaluative components, uh, descriptive components where you say, which painting is, has warmer hues versus cooler hues and things like that. So the trick here is that the assumption is that if you're looking at preference, which is variable, it still should be the case that if someone prefers A over B and B over C, they should prefer A over C, right? Whatever your internal metric is, which may be different, it needs to be consistent. And so the question for us was then, using people's individual differences allows us to give an axis of what people's consistency are. So then the question becomes consistency. And what we are able to show 
is that in this group of schizophrenic individuals that as a group, two things, they're less consistent than people without schizophrenia. They are less consistent in the evaluative judgment, which is this preference as compared to the descriptive judgments. So it's not that they're just inconsistent, they'll say whatever they want, it's specifically about their preference. And then the other interesting thing is if you look across the people with schizophrenia, of course they're not, it's not that they're all bad, that there's some variability, and then you leverage that variability and what we find is that the greater, the greater the variability in people's preferences, judgment, correlates with how they also describe their hedonic experiences. Right? So you give them other kinds of questionnaires and so it turns out that people who uh, have a kind of what has been referred in the literature as um, anticipatory pleasure, right? the pleasure of anticipating what might happen, uh, that people who had decreased anticipatory pleasure were also the ones that were the most variable. Okay, so now you take that back to the biology, it turns out that, uh, that models of anticipatory pleasure seem to really rely on dopamine. Dopamine is a, at least an important system that seems to be abnormal in people with schizophrenia. And what we don't know from this is whether this has to do with the medications they're on or something inherent about the biology of their disease. So that remains unknown. But I offer this as a suggestion how you can use, you can actually leverage the variability of the individual responses to, 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 to honor the individual response and at the same time try to get a generalizing principle out of it. Yeah, um, I, I, did, I think most of us would probably agree that dopamine plays a role in aesthetic pleasure. Um, but I want to go back, I mean these are really interesting experiments, I want to go back to the discussion we were having earlier, um, partly raised by Vittorio and then affirmed by um, Andrea. And this is a discussion which brings together Freudian views of inhibition, Freudian views of culture, the work of the neurosciences, but it's all omitting, I think, in all our discussions, we're omitting one very significant issue, which I'm going to come to in a moment. I think the issue is slightly virtu vitiated by these statements, slightly apodictic statements that people make. You made it, this quite a lot, art is. I think we should probably just relinquish any kind of declaration about what art is. Um, because we kind of know now that we don't know what art is. I mean, you go to any art gallery and you... We, <laughs> and art may just be what people pay the most money for, we don't know. <laughs> so this whole issue was brought home to me with some force. I remember uh, Chris Wood said, to, he may have, we may have been drinking a bit much that evening, but he said exasperatedly to me after I gave a lecture about the sort of motor dimension of aesthetic response, which Vittorio described very accurately, he said, oh, he said, why don't you realize that all art is irony? I mean, he was being kind of uh, epigrammatic that evening, and I was very exasperated <laughs> by this. But he raised a very important issue, which is, I don't think all art is irony, but it's consistently with this view that I don't think we should say what art is or not. But you know, we talk about aesthetic appreciation, I just, uh, aesthetic evaluation, aesthetic enjoyment, I just did that. But what really lies at the bottom of all of this, as you know, Kant wrote, is aesthetic judgment. I mean, we can talk a bit about aesthetic pleasure and aesthetic, you know, how our feelings are affected. But what is moot is not what art is, but what is that moment in which, you know, what happens at that moment when we make an aesthetic judgment? And that moment must surely be a moment of a certain kind of removal, of reclaiming of the self against involvement with the work of art. And this seems to me our sense of absorption in the work of art to use, you know, here's Michael Fried carrying on for years about absorption's role in our aesthetic responses. What really we need now to do, and I think, I'm trying to convince Vittoria to do an experiment with me on precisely what removes the self from its empathetic engagement with the work and what happens then, as it were? You know, what exactly do we mean when we talk about 
inhibition, what's happening in the brain. You know, there are various candidates for the inhibitory factor. I somehow think it's somehow down in basal ganglia. He says, no, it's much forward in prefrontal cortex. So here is a real issue which can be discussed, which will get us back to what seems to me, you know, at least a clear framing of the question, which is the framing in terms of the moment in which we realize we are not in the object, but we are sufficiently detached to make a judgment. This is Andrea and, and Warburg's notion of Denkraum, in which you have the space for contemplation, and the, you have a sense of the realization of who you are as a judging self. So that's a project that you know we've got to get on with, as it were. Yeah. If I can yes. comment on that. So again, going back to individual cases <coughs> and this notion of inhibition of movements in a way that might seem agentic. So there's a, a, a classic, relatively rare, but classic neurologic syndrome called the alien hand syndrome. And this is one in which, uh, which um, we've done one of the few experimental studies of such a patient, right? So let me just describe it for, for people who are not aware of this. Uh, this is a situation where someone's hand, it's typically on one side, seems to perform behaviors that seem complex, but over which they have no control. And so the particular uh, man that we studied uh, about seven or eight years ago, um, I mean, he would come in and he'd sit down and he'd sit down on his hand because he didn't want his hand doing things that he had no control over. Uh, these kinds of, uh, or he'd grab a magazine or a cup and hold this because as long as his hand was occupied, it wouldn't do things. But what are the kinds of things it does? Uh, is that it will, he'll walk by, um, he'll walk by a light switch and his hand will reach up and start doing this, turning on, on and off, on and off, on and off the lights. Um, uh, and there are a variety of these kinds of behaviors. And what we, and his lesion, just so you know, the part of his, uh, the part of his brain that is damaged is the medial part of the frontal lobe, right? It's the classic uh, location for this kind <coughs> of phenomenon. What we were able to show is the conditions in which this happens are two. One is that the control over affordances that most of us normally have, he didn't have. And what do I mean by that? Which is, if you see a cup with the handle, there is a kind of affordance that makes you want to grasp it, right? And it's likely that the mirror neuron system is, in, in fact, involved in that kind of experience. Most of us can choose to do this or not. And it should be clear that most of us our motor systems operate below consciousness most of the time, right? Where usually you think about every time you drive to work or you walk to work, you're not really aware of all the little decisions you're making. We largely respond to things in the environment with our motor systems, and that's what this person was doing, but unlike the rest of us, is not able to control it. The second piece of this is he was exquisitely aware of this. So if you have damage bilaterally, you get something called utilization behavior where people do this, but they're completely apathetic about it. So he had this monitoring system over his own motor behavior. At the same time, he didn't have control over one side. Uh, and then this creates this sense that this limb is doing something of which he has no control over, right? It's completely responsive to the environment. Uh, and so it's a, kind of, it's a kind of a problem with inhibition. At the same time, there's awareness. You have to have both of those things simultaneously to have this kind of phenomenon. Uh, I think, even though I know we can talk a lot more about this, it's time to, right? It's time to go for question and answers. So anybody who has a question has to walk up to the microphone there and ask their question. Peter. There are two papers. Siri, you want to ask? Okay. Most of the okay. Most of the uh, discussion this morning has been on the tension between generalization, and you began with that, and uh, the particular case, and 
your characterization of psychoanalysis. It's a, a single case, and what do you have, and so on. Uh, I'd like to say I practice analysis in Los Angeles, and I've analyzed uh, Chinese and Japanese and Latino. I have a Latino young lady, um, Iranians, and so on. And you get a picture of the culture. And with that, I want to say with Abi Barber today, when we're getting to a man embedded in the German-Jewish elite of Hamburg, major banking firm that you all know, branches in New York and so on. And he suffered and consciously from anti-Semitism. He was a uh, soldier in the German army prior to World War I and was unable to get promoted to reserve officer. It was a uh, very symbolic but full of prestige. Max Weber wrote a brilliant critical piece on the position of the German reserve officer. And he writes to his mother also as he's a student in Strasbourg how he hears other students and people in pubs issuing anti-Semitic remarks. And he's, he's very aware, he's unhappy about it. Uh, he, he calls it Mauschon, which is an imitation of Yiddish. And um, now, that's not all. There is a huge, a very significant Kartai. It's Kartai 61 in the uh, archive, the Warburg archive, and it is his collection. His method of working was to collect clippings from the day's newspapers of things that interested him. And there are large collection of clippings about the ritual murder myth in Eastern Europe. In Kiev, the Bayless case. In Konev, in East Prussia. You know, he collected these, and this was the raw, savage underside of European culture that he was very aware of. And it's significant that uh, the breakdown, the psychotic breakdown, came in November 1918. Now, that's not a random date. That's the date of the collapse of the Wilhelmine Empire. And it's a date where his peer and friend, Albert Balin, whose name you might know, uh, the Hamburg-America line, the Hamburg-Ost-Africa line, the Hamburg-Ost-Asian line, uh, these were all creatures of, he was the CEO of this empire of sea power in Germany. He suicided in November 1918. And uh, Warburg, that's where he had his uh, psychic collapse. And we look for, in psychoanalysis, the uh, specificity, why on that date? And what's the specificity of the delusions? And the delusions were murder and blood poisoning. He tells Binswanger, uh, you're feeding me human blood. I'm not going to eat this meal. I suggest to you that uh, what you really want to know out of psychoanalysis is the culture that he comes from. And he and his brother, you know, there was an event in the middle of World War I in 1916. It's called the Judenzählung, where the Prussian general staff ordered a census of all the Jews in the German military. Now, nothing like that took place on the Italian army, the French army. British Army, but they were with a, a, a purpose of derogating and deprecating the Jews, uh, trying to show they weren't doing their part. And fact is that after this census, the results were suppressed. They were never published until Franz Josef Strauss in the Bundesrepublik was the foreign uh, strike that defense minister, and he published the results because the contribution of Jews had been magnificent to World War I. So uh, uh, this is the world he comes from.
And when he uh, sees murderers and so on, he saw them and he collected data on them, extensive data uh, on German anti-Semitism, on European primitive hatred of the Jews. And I suggest that it comes back in the psychosis. That's, a, that's an intro to your panel tomorrow, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is quicker, and it's about lesions, and it relates to something David said and, and to what you said, which is um, individual differences and lesions. So even in alien hand syndrome, you can get someone unbuttoning a shirt. Um, but also the famous case that I've forgotten the neurologist's name of the self-strangling. Um, and also, amygdala lesions do not produce identical uh, results, by the way. They're a huge variation. So I'm, I wanted to just pick that up about individual differences. Is there a question of content, individual psychic content in something like, say, self-strangling in, uh, in so, alien hand syndrome? Let me make two comments about that. And thanks for the question. So one thing it turns out that in alien hand syndrome is that the repertoire of behaviors are fairly restricted. There are certain grasping behaviors, there are repetitive behaviors. Um, they're actually the kinds of things uh, not unlike what you see when people have uh, motor seizures and what Healing Jackson called, you know, talked about as this uh, sort of grammar of movements where you have these elements that are built, built on. What we argued in this paper is that that what you see in alien hand syndrome uh, are concatenations of these motor primitives and that you would never ever have the situation where someone's alien hand would, for example, write a poem, right? That could never happen on this model, right? Uh, whereas if you really think of this as there's an alien being, I'm a divided self, that the, the, the divided self would actually perform some intentional goal-directed behavior, it turns out that that's probably not the case. The individual differences in terms of the consequences of brain damage uh, is, is extraordinarily interesting, and the biology of that we don't really know very much. So it is the case that often what you will read in the literature are these sentinel cases. But if you see a lot of the patients, what you are struck by is that the same kind of damage that produces Wernicke's aphasia that was so instrumental and important in thinking of how language is organized in the brain is not what happens in everybody. And not only that, what happens six months down the road is highly variable in terms of how people recover. Now, it, what's the biology of that? Why is it that some people do better initially? Why is it that some people do better down the road? Uh, there are some ideas around it. Um, there are certain genetic predispositions. Uh, for example, people that are homozygous for APOE alleles, uh, that is a pre predisposing factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it looks like that might have be more generalizable to how the brain responds to injury, right? So, uh, and but what the mechanisms around that are not known. Uh, it may have. It may be a wiring issue, which is that. Uh, there is, if we took everybody in this room that is over the age of 50 uh, and got high resolution MRI scans, the amount of white matter abnormalities, assuming everybody in here is normal, is going to be highly variable, right? Uh, and so the consequences of that, of this kind of subclinical, low level, and I, I hesitate to use the word damage because it's not expressed in any way, it might have consequences for recovery. So the individual differences in organization at that level, uh, which is increases as you get older. So as Victoria said, if you're doing 20-year-old college students, right. you've already filtered this to a, a very narrow segment, right? So, so I, but I think those are, those are the, exactly the kinds of questions a biologist just needs to ask and try to address. Just walk to the microphone. Okay, sure. Yes, to uh, Professor Galese's uh, correlation of the motor system and Lucio Fontana and, and Franz Klein. I'm an art historian and a psychoanalyst, and I've worked with a lot of artists. And I thought a lot about uh, 
Ernst Chris's image magic, the idea that an artist is trying to create life <coughs> in the work. And the, the, I worked on Giacometti and, and Louise Nevelson, and both of them, and I think many other artists and many of the artists I've worked with, are aiming in some way, conscious or pre-consciously, to create a sense of life, and that is the, the, dy the <coughs> dynamic quality. And looking at artwork that succeeds in doing that, even if it's the, the pregnant moment before the action, there is a sense for an artist who is aiming to make that work, that he or she is trying to do something with what Louise Nevelson called livingness. And um, I think artists have different ways of describing it, but it seems very related to the correlations that you are finding in, in the work that you're doing. Thank you. Pierre? So I would like to make a comment on uh, what Vittorio said, and I fully uh, agree with you with uh, the, um, the current uh, trend uh, of uh, in cognitive neuroscience and the redu reductionistic, let's call it, uh, you know, consequences of uh, 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 being subject to um, considerable pressure uh, and uh, by um, journals to come up with papers that have a large N, a number of subjects that you can make statistics on. And, you know, I'm an experimental neurobiologist. I also, like you, try to publish in the good journals, and we all play that game. But uh, the, the issue is that it looks like we may need, and it's just, you know, come, uh, comes out of this discussion and, and thinking, um, you know, a forum uh, where uh, one, this, this vicious cycle, in a way, which, you know, uh, you are forced, in a way, to have a large and uh, erase individual differences or try to uh, focus on the data that uh, show more consistency across individuals to be able to publish uh, in uh, the best journals. Uh, and, okay, you probably provide uh, useful information. I, I don't say that this is not useful, so I fully agree with you. We are part of the game, and we do it. But, but on the other hand, it's very impoverishing. We lose a lot of information like it's true. this. It's true. And, uh, and, and so I think, um, you know, let's think about how to push this, uh, the, the, val the, the value of individual observations uh, and, 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 and provide a, a forum for this in a way that is, of course, scientifically sound. It's not just to um, uh, you know, decrease the quality of the studies. Quite the contrary. I think that the tools, the expensive toys that you, you're talking about can be used uh, much with a much more um, incisiveness if we were able to uh, provide the right framework for, uh, and, and rigor for a studies of uh, uh, individual uh, individuality. Uh, I think it's an excellent idea, and if I know you enough, uh, <laughs> it will. <laughs> we, we should expect some development. Well, let's think uh, about think, it. You know, no, I, I think you're definitely right, and um, I'm very sympathetic with with the onion because I think we share um, a strong background in uh, clinical neuropsychology. Yeah. Because when people nowadays think about cognitive neuroscience, I'm speaking specifically of cognitive neuroscience, uh, most people think about uh, the, the fancy toys we were discussing before, e.g., uh, neglecting uh, 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 the fact that one of the main, historically speaking, but also nowadays, although it's getting more and more difficult to publish single cases, yes. almost impossible, mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 uh, we learned a lot about the relationship between brain behavior and cognition by studying single patients. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's really um, a sad thing that uh, the enormous pressure we all uh, receive, uh, in, in a sense, living in Italy is a privilege. You can take a lot more risk because nobody cares what you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's interesting, but it's uh, interesting. I'm trying hard to see uh, uh, the positive <laughs> aspect of that. But in other countries where uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, attention about what you produce, uh, so the emphasis is more and more on, on, on quantity, sometimes at the expense of 
I mean, I'm not disputing that the, uh, all of these papers have a, an enormous uh, uh, technical quality. What gets lost is why are we doing this? <laughs> no, <laughs> why are we that, publishing? That, no, that's why, the point why I want to make. It's, it's not that, I mean, I think cognitive neuroscience and all the uh, what has been published in those uh, in circles and with that kind of uh, philosophy, it, I think it's very useful and, and, and brought a lot of knowledge to to how yeah, the brain course. works. I think we understand it's a ma major progress, so I'm not disputing this. But I think we are losing a lot yeah. of information, yeah. And, yeah. and that's a pity. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because we had Professor Andrea Califano here, and he's at Columbia, and he's a microbiologist and mm -hmm. studies cancer. What seems to be happening more and more in cancer study is studies of N of 1. Ah, OK. Interesting. Which would be great if it happened in our field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I give you an example. I, I do a professor's rounds at a rehabilitation hospital in Philadelphia, and last week, uh, the case that was presented to me turned out to be incredibly fascinating, and it relates to something that you were saying, which is this is a guy who was alexic, couldn't read, but had a very specific kind of alexia that I have not seen in the last 30 years, which is he had difficulty identifying individual letters, right? But that that's, has been observed. But what's different about him is that he could identify without any difficulty individual numbers. Right? So the graphemic complexity of numbers and letters are exactly the same. He can see numbers. He can't identify letters. My first thought is we need to bring him in the lab and really study this and, and, and you know, sort out what's happening at that level of visual processing in relation to these symbolic forms, which are letters and numbers, which have no in inherent meaning other than our associations, and how is this even possible? But no takers. None of my, you know, it's, uh, you know, my postdocs are all involved in programmatic research, and, you know, and these cases require a lot of work, because you have to really think through. You can't just set it in motion. Uh, and, but this is the kind of thing that I think, because of, again, our funding mechanisms, that it is not, and publishing, uh, you know, publishing constraints. Um, I mean, these sorts of uh, little, you know, unique uh, N of 1 studies that really have the potential to teach you something important, we're just, we're just letting them slip through our fingers. OK, I think we need uh, to stop because okay. we have, OK, one more question. And then we will stop because we have another, we have Professor Didi Huberman who's going to, he's arrived? No, he's not. You're not the right Yes, he's here. I think I he's see sitting him. there. He's there. <laughs> I thought I saw him, yeah. So, uh, Christina, did you have a question also? I had a comment. Okay, right after this, one comment from Christina, and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Lisa Farber, and I'm an art historian. Um, I'm the uh, former student of Tom Kaufman, so that's probably why I'm here. Um, I've heard your discussion. Please forgive me, I have to use my notes. Um, uh, Dr. Galese was talking about the evaluation of immediate human sort of responses to visual images and uh, that these responses were in some way consistent. And then you were all speaking about the relationship between neuroscience and the evaluation and reception of images. And uh, there was one comment about the possible influence of early life experiences like mother's milk, you know, on the aesthetic taste later in life. I would like to say, you know, to know if the scientists here have really thought about the part of the brain that affects human memory um, and how that um, is a determining factor in people's responses to images. Um, I would also like to suggest, and I, I've studied Warburg naturally because I, I worked at Princeton and um, Tom Kaufman is a um, you know, student of the Warburg Institute. Um, I would also like to suggest that human memory shapes responses to images and that in viewing a work of art, it may be precisely that moment that David Freeberg uh, mentioned, the moment when the immediate physical response stops and then your memory kicks in, you relate what you're seeing to what you already know, and that determines your um, human response. Anyway, I think that Warburg was interested in the gestures and the motifs that, let's say, Botticelli was using from ancient works of art, and how that influenced the reception of his painting in the 15th century. And then also he was thinking about 
um, the images of Albrecht Dürer and how the reception in Germany in the early 20th century was in part affected by people's familiarity, people's memory of those images. So I think that human memory is something that I haven't really heard discussed here very much. And is there a part of the brain that you could measure? Because I think that some of the art historians here, perhaps David Friedberg or Christopher Wood or Andrea Bayer or perhaps myself, we have a slightly different visual memory or ability to mem you know, memorize images, recall things. And so that may determine why we become art historians and also how the regular population understands images. Well, the next comment was made from yeah. Christina, who is a memory expert. And by the way, we'll have a session on memory, right? Yeah. No, actually, my comment was not about that, but we're going to have a discussion tomorrow, yeah. an all dedicated discussion to memory and art and emotions and all those connections. Uh, my comment was actually uh, about what Pierre was saying and all the discussion that was going on. And, and I think, I, I hope this is not trivial, but I want to make sure that we are not, um, we are distinguishing two different levels of analysis. One is the group analysis to understand the general principles. And this is where we started because we, we know basically nothing when we started in many fields. And so that has to be done. It cannot be uh, an uh, individual analysis. And then another level, equally important, is the individual analysis. But that we need to find the way to do that scientifically in a very solid way. So what are the controls? And that uh, it, it has now been developing more and more, clearly. Even in the animal studies, there are the group studies as well the now the individual differences coming out of the group analysis. So I, I don't think it's a matter of selecting which paper is going to be published. I hope I, that's not what we're doing. Uh, I think those are two different levels that needs equally both to be understood yeah. and scientifically, solidly. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have about a 10 minute break and then Professor Huberman will give his paper and uh, then we'll stop for lunch and we resume at what time, Rob? Two o'clock. Thank you to come out for these things. Oh, right. <laughs> 
Yeah. 